Greetings, everyone. My name is Amal Matu, and I'm faculty here at University of Maryland, and welcome to our Crashing Patient Conference. For those of you that are interested in getting CME credit for the lectures that you're going to see, you can get CME credit on EMED Home. Check it out at www.emedhome.com. And for those people that want live lectures, we're going to be right back here in October of 2013. Hope to see you then. All right, well, let's switch gears here and talk about a hot topic in critical care medicine, and that's taking care of the critically ill obese patient. And to get things started, I want to talk to you and present a case that came into our emergency department about six or seven months ago, probably one of the sicker patients we've actually had present from the pre-hospital setting in, in some time. This was a 47-year-old male. who We got a box call on, radioed in, patients coming in with respiratory distress. They radioed the vital signs in, and you can see the patient was hypertensive, tachycardic, tachypnic, and hypoxic despite maximal supplemental O2. When he arrived, we heard he had a past medical history of HIV, unknown CD4 count, hep C, and actually he was a former, or was a liver transplant recipient back in 2004 at a neighboring hospital in Baltimore. The HPI, we got very limited from the patient, unable to really talk, but the paramedics said that unfortunately, he recently developed a recurrent alcohol abuse problem. Heavy drinking, two days earlier had fallen down a number of stairs but refused transport. On the day of his presentation, the family had noted him to be in acute respiratory distress, unable to breathe, and they activated EMS. Our own arrival to the emergency department, we found his vital signs still to be hypertensive, a little bit lower, so 160s over 80s, still tachycardic, still tachypnic, and still hypoxic. Now, to say that this gentleman had a BMI of 45 is actually quite generous or conservative. He was enormous. He was sitting straight up, bolt upright, profusely diaphoretic, markedly tachypnic. On exam, he had rowels at the apices, using every accessory muscles. And with the trauma that he had sustained two to three days earlier, he had a large amount of ecchymosis in the left upper quadrant and then the left flank region. He was immediately switched over and placed on non-rebreather, Given the rowels heard in the apices, we considered acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. He got nitrates right off the bat and quickly actually got non-invasive ventilation placed. However, his chest x-ray was obtained. You can see marked pulmonary edema. He failed non-invasive ventilation. Within a few minutes, he was pulling at the mask. Difficult, we were unable to get any other medications on board. We went to lay him down to attempt to do RSI. He desaturated like a rock. Unfortunately, we tried to bag him up. We couldn't get his oxygenation up high enough before he sustained a cardiac arrest. And we got him back, but we didn't get him back until he had already suffered irreversible neurologic dysfunction. And unfortunately, he was transferred to a long-term care facility where he still resides. So with that, I want to just talk and highlight just a few pearls on the care of the critically ill obese patient. It's becoming, pardon the pun, a huge problem in healthcare. Up to 25% of the patients we admit to the intensive care unit now are in fact considered obese. And I put BMI up there, not simply for you to remember the formula, but perhaps to comment on that it's maybe a sad state of affairs that we've now gone beyond a morbid obese category and we've hit the super obese category or BMI of greater than 50. Now before we get started, it's important to understand there are a few physiologic changes in the obese patient that impact what we do and what care we deliver to this critically ill patient population. Importantly, with each increase in BMI, there's an increase in circulating blood volume. They develop a hyperkinetic circulatory system. As a result, there's no surprise that the LV enlarges. They get left ventricular hypertrophy and eventually develop diastolic dysfunction at baseline. In addition, they have a restricted pulmonary pattern that we'll talk about, as well as a baseline increase in intra-abdominal pressure. We'll talk about all of these effects as we go through the next few sections. So, with respect to some pitfalls in airway management of the obese patient, importantly, there's a number of both anatomic and physiologic changes that you should be familiar with. And it, Quite honestly, obvious. 
Certainly from an anatomic standpoint, you've got that large neck, thick circumference, large tongue, overall that excess cervical fat creating more of a constricted glottic opening. Now more importantly perhaps are the physiologic alterations. These patients have no pulmonary reserve. We'll talk about their low lung volumes momentarily, but they've got no pulmonary reserve. In addition, they've got a sandbag sitting on their belly pushing their diaphragm up. They've got increased intra-abdominal pressure, very low pulmonary reserve, and as a result, probably the first big pearl is that these patients have rapid onset of hypoxemia. If you did apneic ox safe apneic oxygenation for someone like us, we could probably go for six to eight minutes and be fine before we start to desaturate. If you consider a healthy, morbidly obese patient, they have about four minutes until they desaturate. And once you challenge these patients with critical illnesses, they have about one to two minutes before the onset of hypoxemia. Rapidly, these patients can decompensate. In terms of equipment, I think lots of airway courses talk about plan A, B. Certainly for these folks, you want C and D. So that supraglottic airway device. The one pearl I'll say here is that if you end up, God forbid, needing to do a crike, because of that thick cervical neck or excess cervical fat, it's always good to have a 6-0 ET tube handy because your surgical kits may not actually be deep enough or long enough to get into the trachea. From a bag valve mass standpoint, this is absolutely a two provider technique. One person to hold the mask and the other to do ventilations. There is no way this can be a one person bagging technique in these patients. Another big pearl is pre-oxygenation. So sit them all the way up to pre-oxygenate. That will do a little bit better. The other thing is to use a nasal cannula. So when you go to get ready to do that apneic oxygenation, high flow nasal cannula, a little bit north of 15 liters, can also provide a little bit of passive oxygenation by you a little bit more time. If you've got non-invasive ventilation and you have a few minutes, it can be beneficial in pre-oxygenating the obese patient. Usually it takes several minutes to take effect. If someone is crashing, you may not have the time, but if you've got five or 10 minutes, it's probably worth considering non-invasive ventilation, and especially in that hypoxic, critically ill obese patient. A few pearls regarding meds. Remember, induction agents in general are dosed on lean body weight. Regards to Atominate, however, it's total body weight. So the one we use most frequently, Atominate is total body weight. Succinylcholine is also total body weight. And remember, your non-depolarizing agents such as rocuronium is ideal body weight. If you remember nothing else in terms of the pearls of airway management or the pitfalls in the obese patient, it's patient positioning. You absolutely want to get that head of the bed up to at least 30 degrees and get the ear aligned with the sternal notch. You can see here in this picture from one of the Annals articles a few years ago, get that patient, get the head of the bed up at least 30 degrees and keep that external auditory canal in line with the sternal notch for the best or most optimal intubating position for these patients. What about some pearls on mechanical ventilation? That's more of the airway management. Well, what about mechanical ventilation when you put these patients on the vent? Well, importantly, obesity has several effects. It affects lung volumes, lung mechanics, ventilation and perfusion, as well as overall fatiguing the respiratory muscles. Importantly, all lung volumes are down in patients who are critically ill or obese patients. For each unit increase in BMI, there's a 3 to 5% decrease in FRC and expiratory residual volume. Furthermore, there are decreases in the total lung capacity, residual volume, and vital capacity. What this does is essentially in the range of tidal breathing, it keeps the airway pressures very close to closing. So at baseline, many of these patients actually have intrapulmonary shunting. With those low lung volumes, there's no surprise that there's a reduced lung compliance. With the weight and adipose tissue on the chest wall, there's also reduced chest wall compliance compliance, so it makes those respiratory muscle work, muscles work much harder to just maintain normal tidal breathing aside from critical illness. In addition to intrapulmonary shunting, these patients have at baseline VQ mismatching. The upper areas of the lung are better aerated versus the lower areas of the lung that are better, better perfused. So at baseline, intrapulmonary shunting and VQ mismatch. 
And no surprise, with all of these changes, their respiratory muscles at baseline are working in overdrive. Five to ten percent, five-fold increase in oxygen consumption for these patients just to perform normal breathing. Now, when you intubate them, I think everyone is familiar with a lung protective ventilatory strategy of around six to eight mLs per kilogram. For these patients, it's very important to remember that is ideal body weight, huge potential pitfall. It's ideal body weight when setting the tidal volume. The other nice pearl is that remember these patients the range of tidal breathing, a lot of their airways are close to closing, so that intrapulmonary shunting. When you put these patients on PEEP, set PEEP at a higher level. So we're all accustomed to just rattling off five of PEEP. At least 10, if not 12 to 15, as an initial PEEP setting when you intubate the, the morbidly obese patient. And then the other big, big thing regarding positioning for the obese patient, or mechanical ventilation in the obese patient, is positioning. We know that it's harder to ventilate these folks in the supine position. And when they're in the reverse Trendelenburg position, respiratory rates are lower and tidal volumes are higher. So if you have an opportunity, place the patient in the reverse Trendelenburg position. Plateau pressures, we're always shooting for a goal less than 30. It may be a little bit different in the obese patient because transpulmonary pressures are actually a little bit lower. So can these patients tolerate a little higher plateau pressure? Probably. Do we know what the optimal number is? No. But if you're around 30, that's probably okay and understand that these patients, to ventilate them, may be okay to push it just a little bit higher. What about medications? Another key area with respect to the obese patient. Now, importantly, remember drug excretion is increased in the morbidly obese patient. And we dose things based upon whether they're lipophilic or hydrophilic. The many, many critically ill obese patients, when their medications are given, we're either under or overdosing them. So let's go through a few important examples. Antibiotic-wise, vancomycin, very commonly administered in the emergency department and ICU. One of the best studied medications in the obese patient. Recall that this is dosed on actual body weight, and it's not sufficient simply to rattle off one gram of vancomycin IV. It is weight-based. It's based upon actual body weight at a dose of 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram. Probably the upper limits of the first dose is around 2 grams, but it's weight-based on actual body weight, 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram. The penicillins also need to be dosed at the higher range, as well as the cephalosporins, as well as quinolones, because of that increased drug excretion. Your antibiotics need to be at the higher range in terms of dosing. With respect to aminoglycosides, that's adjusted body weight. I've shown you the formula here. And we pay very close attention to aminoglycosides simply because of the risk of nephrotoxicity. What about other medications that we use in our ICU or critically ill patients? So thrombolytics, well, we don't really know. It's not well studied, but we don't believe there to be any dose adjustment. So the same dose that you would use in a non-obese patient you would use for an obese patient. With respect to heparin, remember that's adjusted body weight. And actually low molecular weight heparin can be given to obese patients. We talk about one milligram per kilogram. Now our pharmacies may get a little anxious and reply back that we shouldn't be giving them. But really there's reasonable evidence to say we can go up to 190 milligrams of Lovenox or low molecular weight heparin. Importantly, once you get into the higher doses, it's recommended to follow anti-10A levels as a measure or marker of efficacy. But certainly, we can go higher on these patients. What about pressures? If you need to know, if you need to use pressures, well, we don't know, and we don't think there's any difference. There's really no studies on vasopressor use in the setting of critically ill, obese patients. Most likely, it doesn't affect things and you can continue to use your regular or standard doses that you would use in a non-obese patient. And finally, what about ACS? No, not acute coronary syndrome, but abdominal compartment syndrome. We know that this is increasingly recognized, not only in the ED, but also ICU population. We know that it's associated with increases in mortality, and we know that obese patients are at higher risk of developing abdominal compartment syndrome. Why do we care? Well, abdominal compartment syndrome, or even for that matter, intra-abdominal hypertension, 
has negative effects on many organ systems. From a cardiovascular standpoint, it decreases preload, increases afterload, and overall decreases adequate tissue perfusion. From a pulmonary standpoint, it makes it much harder to ventilate these folks. So we have increases in plateau pressure, decreases in oxygenation as a result of displacement of the diaphragm upward. Thus, when, we've got these pa when we have these patients, it's recommended to check an intra-abdominal pressure. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of the details for time's sake on how you measure it, but there are Foley catheter devices. There's actually the World Society for the Abdominal Compartment Syndrome. You can Google that, and it will show you how to measure it via Foley catheter. But what we want to think about is just simply ACS to begin with, measure a bladder pressure. Normal intra-abdominal pressure is about 5 millimeters of mercury. Intra-abdominal pressure is defined as greater than 12 millimeters of mercury, and abdominal compartment syndrome is defined as greater than 20 milligram millimeters of mercury with organ dysfunction. If you check a bladder pressure and you get 21, 22, and there's a rise in creatinine or decrease in urine output, the next call should be to your acute care emergency surgery service or general surgeon because the majority of these patients need a decompressive laparotomy. Now, as I've shown, you can do a number of non-surgical therapies, but by far and away, you want to get a surgeon involved to see if they need a decompressive laparotomy. So those were some key pearls in terms of criti the critically obese patient. Let me just go through those once again, especially in light of the, that difficult case that we had. With respect to airway management, remember these patients will drop like a rock. Very poor pulmonary reserve at baseline, and when you challenge them with a critical illness, it's even faster. Anticipate that their SATs will drop like a rock. Get that head of the bed up to 30 degrees when you intubate them. Align the external auditory canal with the sternal notch. Remember your RSI medications. Etominate is actual body weight. Sux is total body weight. Non-depolarizing agents are ideal body weight. When you place them on the ventilator, please, please take note of the ideal body weight and set that 6 to 8 mLs per kilogram. Use a higher PEEP, so at least 10 centimeters of water in these patients. And if you can, place them in the reverse Trendelenburg position. From a medication standpoint, remember drug excretion is increased. So make sure that your antibiotic dosing is appropriate for these patients. Thrombolytics, same dose as non-obese. Vasopressors, same dose as non-obese. And then finally, think about abdominal compartment syndrome. Many of these patients actually have baseline elevations in their intra-abdominal pressure, so it takes very little to kick them over into abdominal compartment syndrome. If you've got an obese patient where you're having high plateau pressures and you can't ventilate or oxygenate them, or you're having problems with refractory shock, the answer could be in the belly. Check a bladder pressure, and if it's above 20 with that associated organ dysfunction, Next call to be, will, should be to your surgeon for a decompressive laparotomy. So with that, I hope I've given you some really key pearls in the management of the critically ill obese patient. I want to thank you for your attention, and we'll move on to the next topic.